talking to you today about winter driving. Yes, checking in in January 2020 to give you some tips and techniques that will keep you on the road and out of the ditch. Stick around. <laughs> we'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about winter driving tips and strategies to keep you on the road, keep you safe. Uh, teach you about skid control in case you do lose control of your vehicle and what happens if it does go out of control uh, and we'll teach you all of that and give you some information techniques and skills that you can put into place to keep yourself on the roadway so a few people are here Carrie's here Katie's here uh, bricks for wheels bricks for wheels is Corey Corey is the moderator here on the smart drive test uh, channel all about vehicles hello my friend how are you uh, and yes, if you're just checking in, let us know where you're checking in from in the world, what class of license you're going for. And Jonathan is here as well from New York City. Jonathan is a CDL driver and is excellent at answering questions and creating discussion here on the live stream. So if you have any questions, Jonathan will be more than happy to help out. Really awesome group and community of smart drivers that we had now have here after four years on the Smart Drive Just uh, Smart Drive Test channel that I was talking about that over the holidays and talking about the founding story and <laughs> you know a little bit incredulous that it's been four years already time does indeed fly uh, on the channel so as I said if you're just checking in let us know where you're checking in from Destiny's here from Cleveland Ohio great place uh, Sawant so, so uh, is from checking in from Pennsylvania in on the East Coast there so that's awesome and Katie's from Arkansas, Frederick from Denmark, brilliant. And as I said, we're gonna try and get into some other countries this year and do some videos. Uh, I do have a trip planned for Britain uh, in April. I have another trip planned for Australia and both of those trips will be driving on the other side of the road. <laughs> Maybe we can even get some CDL driving in for you. So uh, today, let's see, where are we here? Yes, so this week I got in a video for you on how to buy a vehicle, actually how to buy a vehicle and how to interpret the story that that vehicle tells. Uh, that's what I was working on this week in terms of creating that series on how to buy a vehicle. And uh, if you have any suggestions about topics that you would like covered in terms of how, what, how to buy a vehicle, how to buy a vehicle from a dealership, how to buy a vehicle from privately, what you need to look for. Uh, uh, I'm gonna do some more videos on that and uh, that will definitely help you out in terms of buying a car after you get your license and buying a particularly a used vehicle, a secondhand vehicle, because a lot of you are not simply not gonna be able to afford a brand new vehicle in this day and age because they're you know, $30,000, $40,000. So one of the things that you want to do, uh, I'll just talk about this briefly before I start the presentation on winter driving, is when you're looking for a vehicle, uh, go on the internet and go to um, the Auto Trader, eBay, uh, I'm trying to think of another one, uh, Craigslist, all of those have cars for sale and start looking at the cars that are there. Uh, figure out what kind of vehicle you want, how much money you have to spend, what your budget is, and what kind of, you know, so what kind of car are you going to get for the money that you have available is what you want. And do not get stuck into the thing that, you know, there's a scarcity of vehicles. There's tons and tons of vehicles out there. So get the vehicle that you want. Once you sort of narrow it down, you've looked at the reviews, you know, you know, what you're going to get for how much money you have, then start doing research and start narrowing it down, start talking to people. When you actually go out and look at the vehicle, make sure that you do a complete pre-trip inspection. Don't think that you're holding the people up who are selling you the vehicle. Take your time, go through the vehicle, make sure that everything in the vehicle works. The windows work, the doors work, every door works, all the locks on the doors work, the mirrors work, the hood, the hood opener works. Make sure that absolutely everything on the vehicle works. Check the tires, make sure the tire, tires aren't worn down to the wear bars, make sure there isn't any rust on the vehicle you know just everything just go through it with a fine tooth comb and that will help you to determine whether you want to buy the vehicle or not and and as well <laughs> keep in mind 
every vehicle the price of the vehicle is negotiable okay so again have a look at that video have a look at the other video I'm not going to spend too much more time on that because I know people want to talk about winter driving and that's what we talked about so maybe what we'll do is we'll have another live stream about how to how to buy a vehicle and that'll help you out there so alright so a few other people here uh, Corey put the video up for you on how to buy a vehicle uh, all about vehicles is from Toronto Maxwell happy new year and everyone on this channel Max here checking in from Sweden awesome so somebody from Sweden somebody from Denmark brilliant uh, how you does a snowbank count as a curb when doing a hill park got my test tomorrow thanks for your, the videos yes uh, Larry it, if you're doing your test tomorrow in the winter Corey will put the video up for you on how to do your road test in the winter time yes the snowbank counts as the curb <laughs> because uh, I'll tell you right now the driving examiner will not push your vehicle out of the snowbank if you get stuck okay so know that all right <laughs> blessed my friend happy new year hope you're doing well yes doing excellent here Alexander has a 2004 Highlander uh, Highlander I believe that's a Toyota vehicle so yes awesome so lots of people here and so we're gonna get started on the driving in bad weather and that's what we're talking about today and what you want to do is you want to keep your vehicle on the road <laughs> you don't want to be in the ditch and I had an experience with this last week we had a little bit of snow we were coming down the mountain there kind of a steep downhill and around a curve and the three kids were in the back uh, one of my friends uh, one of my daughter's friends rather was in the back seat and the car broke loose <laughs> and they, they all got very excited when the car broke loose and, and actually my daughter's friend said to me uh, she said uh, <laughs> Oh my God, you're such a bad driver. I said, no, I, was a, I would have been a bad driver had we been in the ditch. So it does, uh, it does happen that, uh, that the vehicle is going to break loose in bad weather on snow and ice. And, you know, you just need to drive for the conditions of the roadway. And I was driving for the conditions of the roadway because I wasn't going very fast. I was only doing about 25 or 30 kilometers an hour at the time because I was coming down a hill and braking uh, on, <clears throat> on conditions there. So... Oh, Larry, you're in Vernon. <laughs> yes, we definitely have snow here in Vernon. So, yes, uh, there you go. There's the test, uh, the video for winter time. There you go. And, yes, uh, Larry, for hill parking, the three-in-one rule. So everything's in towards the shoulder except uphill with a curb. And uphill with a curb, think of Superman, up, up, and away. So you're pointed up hill and your wheels are away and then you let it roll back against the curb. But if you're going into a snowbank, you're not going to let it roll back into a snowbank, obviously. All right, so back to the slide presentation. For those of you who are new to Smart Drive Test, consider subscribing. My name is Rick August, and I do have a PhD in legal history. My uh, area of expertise is policing as it relates to traffic. If you don't know already, uh, legal history is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And uh, my expertise, as I said, is in policing as it relates to traffic. I became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. Uh, I'm a licensed commercial driving instructor in the province of Ontario and in British Columbia here. And as well, I was a driving instructor in Australia when I lived there uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, 2006, I graduated my doctorate from the University of Melbourne. And while I was going to university, I drove for both uh, Greyhound and for one of the regional bus lines there as well. And uh, Australians are fond of saying that Greyhound was founded in Australia. I don't know whether that's true. I never followed that up. So maybe one of the smart drivers knows uh, whether <laughs> whether Greyhound was in fact founded in Australia. So the first thing you want to know about winter driving is, is that it is going to be more treacherous when the temperature is around zero. So take note of the temperature outside. So zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit for our friends in the south. Uh, in the United States and other countries that are still on the imperial system so it's going to be more slippery when it's snowing and the temperature is around zero so take note of the temperature outside and for many of you driving newer vehicles they're going to have the outside temperature indicated on the dash in the vehicle and if it says it's around zero some of them will say oh there's possibly a warning of ice but just know that if it's zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit there's a good chance that there's going to be snow are going it's going to be slippery all right so when it gets slippery and it's around zero it's going to be slushy there's going to be a lot of gook coming off the roadways because they put salt down on the roadways and sand and that's going to be spit up by the tires from the other vehicles on the roadway so make sure that you have good washer fluid in your vehicle and a friend of mine just said to me 
that she had to do a major repair on her vehicle because she didn't put winter washer fluid in the washer fluid container. So make sure in the winter time that you put in winter washer fluid. Don't put the summer stuff in because it will freeze. Don't put water in because it will freeze and you'll break the container because as we know, when you freeze water, ice expands, it gets bigger. So know that, that you will create, you will cause damage to your vehicle and it will cause, it'll be a costly repair. So washer fluid, if uh, you run out of washer fluid or in, as in the video here that I have posted that Corey just put up here for us, uh, you may need to go into the fuel station and actually clean the windows. So use the squeegee at the fuel stations, okay? And stay away from sand trucks, the salt shakers as we call them in the trucking industry because they throw up rocks and they will uh, create chips on your windshield. And unfortunately, I didn't get to uh, the windshield repair place early enough this year. Uh, and I had four stone chips on the windshield on the buggy. And because I had four stone chips on the windshield, uh, they cracked and be, when the, once the windshield cracked, uh, it needs to be replaced. If you get the chips into the window repair place, it's only gonna be about 60 or $70 to repair it. So if you have some stone chips on your windshield, get it into the glass repair place, let them do their thing, and it's gonna be a lot cheaper than replacing the windshield. So just a note on stone chips, particularly in the winter time. All right, tires. Make sure that you have good winter tires on your vehicle. Uh, I am prone to Michelin, and I'm gonna approach Michelin and <laughs> see if I can be an ambassador for them. I do like their tires. Uh, if you do not uh, get winter tires per se, you need tires that have M&S rating on them or they need to have the mountain symbol on them. Uh, many jurisdictions, North Dakota, here in British Columbia, the province of Quebec, uh, they haven't mandated winter tires per se, but you do have to have winter tires in your vehicle to be allowed to drive on certain roads. So here in British Columbia, for example, there are many highways through mountain passes and whatnot that you have to have winter tires on your vehicle. They have to have the M&S symbol or the winter snowflake symbol, the mountain with the winter snowflake symbol in them. Otherwise, you're not allowed on those roads and you could receive a fine. Now, if you're driving in areas, Minnesota, northern Minnesota, North Dakota, Idaho, places like that, where you get a lot of snow and uh, hard pack on the roadways, you may even want to consider putting steel studded tires on your vehicle. Uh, they will give you much, much better traction. Now, I know that in some places, uh, steel studded tires are, they're not legal, but here in British Columbia, we, they are legal. You do have to have them off your vehicle by the end of March, so you can't run them around past the end of March. So know that, that there is a date that you have to have those, uh, ve those tires off your vehicles. And as I said, stopping on ice, if you have steel studded tires, it's going to help immensely in terms of the traction. Now, stopping on ice, one of the golden rules for winter time is, is that you have to use the, uh, primary controls independently. So for example, you can't steer and brake at the same time. You have to do <laughs> one or the other. You have to brake in a straight line and then get the vehicle slowed down. And then when you get slowed down enough that you can go around the corner, take your foot off the brake and allow the wheels to turn and then go around the corner. <laughs> Actually, I watched a friend of mine come into my laneway last week and they did that very thing, they held the brake down and then tried to turn the vehicle. You can't do that in the winter time. They have to be two separate actions. So because they're two separate actions, you have to start working earlier. You have to start braking sooner. And that's exactly what you wanna do in the, in the winter time to keep yourself on the roadway is you want to brake early and then creep up to actually where you want to stop. That way, when you get to where you wanna stop, you're gonna stop and you're not gonna skid into the intersection. So that's how you stop on the, on the, in the winter time, okay? Separate actions on the primary controls, all right? Now, loss of control. You are going to lose control of the vehicle on slippery conditions because of over acceleration, over braking, or over steering. So any overuse of the primary controls, the steering wheel, the brake, and the throttle is going to cause you to lose control because a locked or spinning wheel always leads. So in other words, if you have the wheels locked up, even with ABS in this day and age, 
you those wheels are going to go out of control they're going to go out of the straight line of where you want to go if the wheels are spinning the same thing the front end's going to go sideways or the back end's going to go sideways if you have a uh, rear wheel drive vehicle which they're rare i mean maybe if you're driving a pickup truck uh, and you don't have it in four-wheel drive because most pickup trucks in this day and age are going to be four-wheel drive uh, some of them will have auto detect as soon as they detect wheel spin they'll kick in the four-wheel drive I know the Dodge Rams are like that. Uh, some of the vehicles are gonna be all wheel drive, but as soon as the wheels start to spin, you're going to lose control of the vehicle. So know that that overuse of the primary controls could potentially cause you to go out of a line and cause you to get into trouble. All right, oversteering. <laughs> oversteering is when you turn the steering wheel and the back end starts to come around. And it really freaks a lot of people out when that happens but it's often a result of you trying to turn the vehicle going too fast and as well you usually have your foot on the brake because what happens is, is that when you have your foot on the brake you change the equilibrium in the vehicle so when you brake the vehicle the front end of the vehicle sits down when the front end of the vehicle sits down the back end of the vehicle gets lighter because you're braking and what happens if it, you're on loose conditions and you're going too fast it sits up like this and the vehicle comes around pickup trucks are especially prone to oversteering because there's very little weight on the back end in relation to what's on the front end because you've got the front end you've got the motor most as I said most uh, pickup trucks in this day and age are all four-wheel drive so the motor the the axle the transfer case there's a lot of weight on the front end which causes this front end to go down the back end to lift up and it's going to go around in a circle and your pickup truck or your other vehicle that is similar uh, in weight distribution is going to go into the ditch all right so oversteering so going to corners with the brakes applied and over acceleration is often the best our acceleration is often the best option so you want to try and get off the brake and then maybe accelerate a little bit to power up to get the vehicle going again and get it around that corner and pull it out of that loss of control all right Understeering, and this will happen on snow and ice as well. Understeering is when you turn the steering wheel and the vehicle doesn't turn, it just continues to go straight. <laughs> and that's a bit freaky when that happens uh, because you're like, oh my God, what are we doing? And uh, the saying in racing circles is that oversteering scares the heck out of the passenger, understeering scares the heck out of the driver. <laughs> so that's the way you can think about it. Uh, you're traveling too fast in the corners on slippery conditions and chop steering which is gonna, what I'm going to talk about a little bit here uh, now is chop steering is one of the ways when you're on uh, ice and snow or other slippery conditions if you're on gravel or you're on sand or something like that and the vehicle won't turn then what you can do is you can do this with the steering wheel this is that you turn the steering wheel a little bit until the front tires gain traction you bring it back to straight the wheels start to spin again they get traction and then you bring it back if you watch rally car racing you'll see the drivers do that and the other uh, technique uh, uh, the other trick so to speak for lack of a better word that rally car racers use is they'll put a piece of tape on the top of the steering wheel so they know where straight is on the steering wheel because all steering wheels on vehicles turn approximately one and a half revolutions in each direction sometimes two but I've seen that on big trucks but I haven't seen it on uh, passenger vehicles most passenger vehicles are one and a half revolutions to the right and one half to the left so they put a piece of tape on the top and then they'll go around a corner and they'll do chop steering and that allows them to get traction and keep the wheels spinning so the vehicle can go around and go faster so if you lose if you get into an understeering situation uh, on snow and ice that's what you can do to try and regain control of the vehicle and then again in skid situations the other thing you want to do is you want to get off the throttle you want to get off the brake and you want to look in the direction that you want to go if you look in the direction you want to go there's a bet much better chance that that's what's going to happen you're going to go in the direction that you want to go okay skid control first and foremost in terms of skid control drive for the conditions of the road you are most likely going to get into trouble in snow and ice going too fast on slippery conditions especially when the temperature is around zero okay so take note if the temperature is around zero and don't drive like a crazy person okay 
So steer in the direction you want to go, chop steering, get off the brake, get off the throttle because what happens is, is that people get uh, excited and they get on the brake and as soon as you get on the brake you lock up the wheels and as soon as you lock up the wheels that's what happens. The vehicle goes into a skid and you can't recover for it. So you have to get your foot off the brake and you have to allow the wheels to roll again and regain traction. And if you can do that, then oftentimes if you're looking where you want to go, you've got your seatbelt on, you're being, you're staying in the seat and you're going to get out of the skid, okay? And get out of the ruts, uh, the main ruts on the roadway and into the deeper snow. And that'll help you to slow down, maybe even give you a little bit of traction that you previously had not had. All right. So, uh, yeah, sorry, just transition back here. Yeah, so the most important thing, get off the throttle, get off the brake, look in the direction you want to go to recover from a skid, and steer like a crazy person. And as well, I know there are some people out there that do not want to wear their seatbelts for whatever reason, but in the in seatbelts do one of two things. Seatbelts will protect you in the event of a collision, and seatbelts as well keep you in the driver's seat in the event of an emergency. <laughs> and that's the more important thing about a seatbelt because it's really tough to drive your car if, <laughs> if you're not sitting in the driver's seat. So if you get into an emergency situation, then <laughs> you need to have your seatbelt on so you stay in the seat. So know that for the purposes of uh, skid control, skid recovery, okay? So steer in the direction you wish to go. Don't give up, work the steering wheel like a crazy person. You're gonna have to manipulate that steering wheel. It was like when I come down the hill there uh, last week with the kids in the back seat, and, you know, the car's breaking loose and zigzagging down the hill. I was steering like a bit of a crazy person, so know that. And again, so wear your seatbelt, and if a crash is imminent, okay, try to reduce your speed as much as possible in the imminent event of a crash, okay? Look in the direction you want to go. Look for your out. Keep searching for your out. Don't just give up. Okay, steer like a mad person and aim for something small, not a tree, not a rock, not, <coughs> excuse me, not a deep ditch, because those things don't move, all right? Aim for something soft if you are going to crash, all right? A hedge, uh, a bush, a small animal, uh, you know, a fence or something like that if you do, if you are going to crash, okay? So you can uh, reduce the amount of... Um, the amount of damage that you that's going to happen to your vehicle and know that modern vehicles are designed to crumble so even a minor crash you know may write off your vehicle and that's not going to be a bad thing because remember uh, vehicles can be fixed you can't so yeah come home safe all right so conclusion take note of the temperature outside if it's around zero degrees celsius or 32 degrees fahrenheit know that it's going to be much much more slippery than it would be if it's sub-zero temperatures minus 15 for example as it would be in winnipeg where corey lives uh, it's going to be less treacherous when the temperature is minus 15 because you've got good grip with your tires and the snow is crunchy and it, it provides decent traction. Whereas when it's at zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you get that layer of water on top of the ice, which makes it slippery. Have good winter tires on your vehicle. Make sure your vehicle is uh, equipped for winter. Have winter washer fluid in uh, in the washer fluid uh, jug inside the vehicle don't you don't want to do a major repair because you put summer washer fluid in there and it froze and broke your tank all right skid control you're gonna generally get into trouble because you're driving too fast for conditions or you've either spun the tires or you've locked up the wheels and if you do go into a skid because you've got your foot on the brake get your foot off the brake steer the vehicle look in the direction you want to go and don't give up Okay, and if a crash is imminent, if you are unfortunate enough that you're going to be involved in a crash, aim for something small. Look for your out. Make sure you have your seatbelt on and know that, you know, if you do hit something small, you may write off the vehicle because if it's twelve dollars or $15,000 in this day and age, these vehicles are just, you know, they're all the front end is designed to crumple in the event of a collision to protect the occupants inside the vehicle. So know that and they may write off the vehicle. So that's essentially winter driving. We'll, uh, can, we'll dedicate the rest of the live stream for questions and answers and answer any questions you have. Uh, so that's essentially winter driving. So be safe, take your time and know uh, one other point that I'll make about winter driving is, is that the farther you get away from the main roads, the more snow and ice is going to be on the roadways because when it snows in the winter time, they look after the main roads first 
They don't look after the back residential streets and those types of things. Now, if you do get a large amount of snow in a short period of time, as we did here the, a couple of nights ago uh, in the Okanagan Valley, I was driving back from Kelowna to Vernon, and there was a fair bit of snow on the ground, and it was around zero. But the buggy, as we fondly refer to the 1998 Honda CRV that I drive, the buggy, <laughs> it's a first generation CRV, uh, the Honda CRVs. Uh, I I have to say it is probably the best winter vehicle ever built. <laughs> I just don't know that thing just sits on the road, and it doesn't matter how much snow is on the road, that buggy just holds the road. So uh, maybe we could just let in the uh, tell me in the comments if you're watching on the replay or you're here now. Just let me know what kind of vehicle you drive in the winter time and how you find it on snow and ice. Do you find it fairly good or? Uh, get good winter tires on and it just plows through the snow and those types of things because I know that the, the that Honda CRV that first generation Honda CRV it's also um, what they they called it real-time four-wheel drive so essentially what it is is that it's front-wheel drive most of the time but if it detects wheel spin it'll kick in the back wheels as well so it, it's a solid vehicle on the roadway all right so I'll answer a few questions here Corey's got up some of the videos here to help you out with winter driving and uh, BD, how are you? Lisa's here as well, excellent. Uh, maybe on a big truck, not on a passenger vehicle. Uh, Chad asked, should you use your Jake brake down a 10% grade on snow and ice? Yes, Chad, you do need to use your, your Jake brake uh, if it's more than a kilometer, okay? Uh, the other thing that you might need to do, Chad, is you might need to chain up one of the tires. Uh, for example, if you have a semi-trailer on, you might need to sit, uh, just throw a single chain onto one of the tires on the back of the semi-trailer just to stop it from coming around. Or you might need to throw one chain just on the back of the truck as well uh, just to get some traction while you're going down the road. Now, it's going to depend on a 10% grade, you know, how, how long is that descent, right? Is it, if, it, if it's more than a kilometer, then yeah, you're going to need to use the jake brake. If it's less than a kilometer, just use your service brakes. You're going to be fine going down on something that's less than a, than a kilometer. All right, so Lisa says she has a 200, 2001 Ford Ranger, which is really great in the snow. That's awesome. Uh, Tim Cena, uh, so will an instructor deduct points if you stop a little bit on the crosswalk if you're in wintry conditions? Uh, Tim Cena, excellent question. Again, have a look at the uh, pass your road test in the wintertime video because I talk about that in the wintertime. And this is one of the points that I make about taking your road test in the wintertime and I encourage smart drivers to take your road test in the wintertime because it's a little bit easier because it's less exact. And it's the question that was asked earlier. Uh, Larry was asking me uh, that, you know, the snowbank. So you don't have to stop at the painted lines if you can't see the painted lines because they're covered with snow. You basically come up and stop before the sidewalk. That's all you need to do. If you can't see the lines on the roadway, just stop before the sidewalk. And then as long as the sidewalk's clear, then you move up, you yield to other road users and then proceed when, when you can see in the way is clear. Okay, so that's what you do in the winter time. So have a look at that video and it'll give you a lot more detail about taking your road test in the winter time. Okay, uh, Katie, yes, excellent question. If, if, if I say anything, just for all the smart drivers that are here now and, and anybody watching on the replay, if I say anything that you don't understand, please, please ask me because there's a lot of terminology uh, in terms of learning how to drive, in terms of preparing for a road test. Uh, some of it for some people is second nature. For other people, it's not. You know, painted islands, controlled intersections, uncontrolled intersections, advanced greens. I mean, all of this is jargon and terminology. So just uh, leave a comment, ask me in the in the questions and those types of things. And Jonathan asked that, answered that question for Katie there. So yes, accelerate. That means to speed up. Okay, to increase your speed in the vehicle is to accelerate. And just another point that's confusing is is that uh, the accelerator, the gas pedal, the fuel pedal. The throttle, it has three or four different names, which again is confusing. And for me, as a CDL driving instructor, I teach truck and bus driving, which are diesel engines, I tend to call it the throttle because it's the throttle works for both 
a diesel engine and it works for a gas or petrol engine as well and there you go again another something else that has two names gasoline or petrol right so it's a petrol engine or a gasoline engine so we you know everything's got a couple of names and you know and when you get into trucking or you get into bus driving again it's everything's got a couple of names which just drives you crazy okay uh, Lisa I've been watching you for my G2 test excellent congratulations Lisa on going for your G2 that is very exciting Aditi, uh, how do you get back on the road after an accident? Uh, Aditi, that is an excellent question. Uh, Corey will also put up the, the video for you on fear and anxiety. And I know a little about, little bit about this, Aditi, because two reasons. One, I worked as a driver rehabil rehabilitation specialist at a hospital, uh, Parkwood Hospital in London, Ontario, working with people who had had crashes, people who you know lost a limb or had a debilitating injury and we're going back to driving and help them to do that myself personally I have been run over on my bicycle while I was in traffic and let me tell you I had to get right back on my bicycle because I knew if I left it for a few weeks I wasn't gonna do it so my suggestion is to you is to get back in the car as soon as possible uh, and start driving uh, you don't have to get out on busy roads and in traffic and those types of things but I do encourage you to get on to residential roads, go into parking lots, work with the pylons, maybe do some of the exercises in the learn to drive video. Corey will put that up for you. Uh, you know, just get in the vehicle, start familiarizing yourself with the vehicle, and get back driving behind the wheel. You know, and and do it in small increments. Don't go, don't say, oh, I'm going to drive for a couple hours because if you drive for a couple hours, you're just going to wear yourself out. Just go out for five or ten minutes, get in the car, do up your seatbelt, maybe drive around the block, come back, park the vehicle, and then you know leave it for a couple hours and maybe do that three or four times a day. So just do it in small increments, and then as you get more and more comfortable and you know you you're able to control your anxiety or your fear, uh, then you can do more and more as you build up. But the the fear and anxiety video will really give you a lot of tips and and strategies to be able to. Uh, <clears throat> get back to driving after you've had a crash and you know if you if if you're having a lot of trouble getting back in and you have a lot of anxiety you may have to seek out a professional somebody that can really help you do that like an occupational therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or somebody else that could really you know maybe help you with some of that anxiety and fear okay because it, it is a real problem all right Patricia uh, first time driving in icy conditions here in Canada I'm from a uh, tropical country what does the brake feel so weird on icy roads? It scares me. <laughs> yeah, it's not surprising, Patricia, at all. Uh, thanks for your question. Yeah, the, the brake feels weird because, uh, first of all, most vehicles in this day and age, almost all vehicles in this day and age are going to be fitted with ABS brakes, anti-lock braking systems. And anti-lock braking systems activate really quickly on slippery conditions, which may or may not be a good thing. I personally don't like it okay I would rather just have standard brakes but those ABS brakes when they activate on slippery conditions cause the brake pedal to pulsate to shudder there's vibration there's noise it sounds like you're launching the space shuttle uh, all of that is normal for anti-lock braking systems and the other thing that kind of scares you I'm sure it does if you haven't experienced that before Patricia is that it's going to take you longer to stop because the vehicle just keeps rolling forward so know that 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 is probably what your experience is is the anti-lock braking systems and as well because it's slippery it just keeps going so essentially what you need to do uh, Patricia is you need to you know maybe like a half a block maybe even two-thirds of a block back from the intersection where you're gonna stop you actually start to slow down at that point and then you creep up to where you actually want to stop so that way when you get up to the intersection you're not gonna come up and nail the brakes and then slide into the intersection because unfortunately that will happen so <clears throat> excuse me slow back slow down back from where you want to stop and then creep up to where you want to stop that's gonna be your best bet in the winter time especially coming from roads that have been clear all the time okay Lisa, 28, I'm scared, but have been getting my confidence back since I was driving and I went into the ditch. It was winter uh, at the time. I'm getting better. Excellent. So that's really great. So it sounds like that, you know, um, nobody was hurt going into the ditch. There was no damage or anything like that. Lisa, it sounds like you're getting back on track there and everything's going well. Excellent. 
Nicola, thank you for your great videos. You are most welcome, Nicola. We're so glad that you're part of the Smart Drive Test community and that we can help you out. Awesome. Tim Cena, I have a cerebral palsy and difficult eyesight, so when I was able to get my permit, it was awesome to accomplish that. That is absolutely excellent, Tim Cena. Uh, and I'm probably not saying that right. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Uh, the other thing I would suggest is have a look at Jen's video. She had... Uh, 2100 eyesight and she went back and got her license again <coughs> excuse me uh, with low vision so have a look at that video that'll help you out as well and know that you can do it you can get back going there uh, yeah excellent yeah and the other and the other thing is uh, what Jonathan's just saying here that make sure you drive a little bit slower than the speed limit the posted speed limit because remember and that's an excellent point that Jonathan made the, the posted speed limit along a roadway is under ideal conditions so if the conditions are not ideal you're driving in the dark you're driving in uh, inclement weather you're driving in the winter time and there's snow and ice on the roadways yes you can drive slower because the, that posted speed limit is for ideal conditions drive to your own ability to don't go being a crazy person and driving 400 miles an hour you know if you're not comfortable driving really quickly or driving the posted speed limit then don't drive the posted speed limit especially on a multi-lane roadway stay in that right hand lane and do what you're comfortable with okay now one of the things that I will ask you not to do in the winter time when weather is bad when it's foggy or it's raining or whatever do not drive with your four-way flashers on okay it's just annoying all of us all of the other drivers myself included we're on the roadway we know that it's bad conditions <laughs> there's nothing more annoying than being in a pack of vehicles and somebody's got this going on the whole time it's like yes we know it's bad I don't know where this originated from maybe somebody has a hypothesis or a theory about where this comes from that drivers get this idea that when they get into bad weather conditions they have to turn their four-way flashers on that's not what they're for don't do that now on the other hand if you're a CDL driver if you're a truck or bus driver and you're going up a hill and you drop be below 40 miles an hour or 40 kilometers an hour on the highway activate your four-way flashers okay they don't do that in Australia but they do that here in North America and it's a really good thing to tell other traffic that you're going slow on a hill so that you don't get rear-ended because uh, personal experience my experience <laughs> I didn't know they didn't do this in Australia and Contrary to popular belief, they do have a few hills in Australia, the Great Dividing Range, I think they call it. And, you know, middle of the night, I'm in the bus, I'm tootling along at 100 kilometers an hour on cruise control, and I'm coming up on this truck, and all of a sudden I realize, you know, I'm not kind of paying attention for a brief moment, it sometimes happens when we're driving. And all of a sudden I realize this truck is doing like 40 kilometers an hour on the highway. And uh, there was a, a bit of mad scramble for me to get out into the other lane and get around the truck. Uh, so know that, that if you're doing, and even for all the other smart drivers, maybe you're driving a passenger vehicle, you're going to the dump with the trailer, and you're going up a hill or something like that, and the truck drops below 60 kilometers an hour or 40 miles an hour, put your four-way flashers on to indicate to other traffic that you are traveling slower than the posted speed limit. You are traveling slower then the traffic flow on the roadway and that will keep you safe okay it'll keep you safe and it'll keep other people safe because it makes you predictable you're now communicating effectively with other traffic okay excellent <clears throat> all right Aditi, uh, advise people to put in a dash camera in car we really help sometimes yes it can <laughs> Aditi, you, the other thing that a dash cam tell you is, is that you're a bad driver. I know that I have a dash cam in my video in my car, and there's times that I look at the uh, <clears throat> at the video and I realize, uh, yeah, that light wasn't yellow when I went through. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, it can, yeah, and it can definitely help you in the event of a crash. It may work against you too because you it might show that you were in the wrong. So, dash cams you know they're a two-edged sword 
they can work for you or unfortunately they could potentially work against you as well so know that in terms of dash cams and as well uh, on the planning here I have a video for a review of one of the Garmin dash cams because I purchased a new dash cam last fall uh, and I don't like doing reviews of things right away I always like using them a little bit uh, before I make a review because I want to make sure that what I'm recommending for smart drivers is going to work for them and work well for them so uh, the Garmin dash cams tend to be a little bit more expensive they're in the kind of $250 range and uh, so I want to make sure that that is something that I can recommend for you to spend your money on and actually use in your vehicle all right uh, Katie, if uh, not in the manual, but can someone who is legally deaf drive, will I need a special sticker to inform others that I am deaf? Uh, Katie, I don't think so. Uh, you may need to go on the website, the DOT website there where you live and have a look at the information there. Usually they put the information uh, on the DOT website. Of course, unfortunately, sometimes it's a little difficult to kind of make your way through all of that information because they kind of hide it in the background somewhere. But uh, have a look and see what you can find on the website. Also, maybe just if you want, you can send me an email. I'll see what I can find for you in terms of helping you out with that. All right, so the other thing uh, that goes, that dovetails with winter driving is defensive driving. The two dovetail together, right? So defensive driving is another area of winter driving. And usually when people are teaching defensive driving courses, they kind of just... Uh, throw winter driving in there winter driving is in and of itself a topic right by that can stand alone but defensive driving and the four components of defensive driving are space management speed management observation and communication we talked about all of that the interesting part is is that those four fundamental components are also the four fundamental components that you need to master to be successful on a road test so space management, I say this to people, to drivers all the time, I say it to the smart driver community, that if you're not near anything, it's less likely you're going to hit something. So manage space well, two to three second following distance under ideal conditions, okay? Good roads, good lighting, good weather, <clears throat> those types of things. So two to three second following distance. There's a few other rules in terms of space management where you stop at intersections before the stop line, uh, before the sidewalk or crosswalk lines. And if those two conditions don't exist, then you stop at the edge where the two roads meet. Okay, so that's at intersections, usually controlled intersections, but not all the time. All right, uh, stop in traffic so that you can see the tires making clear contact with the pavement. And that is one skill that I would encourage you as a smart driver to keep after you get your license because it's very good posturing for not preventing yourself being rear-ended because if you're looking in the rear view mirror while you're sitting there, if you're the last one in the line, you can see vehicles coming up behind you and if you're back so you can see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement, you can simply drive out and around or simply move up that one car length and oftentimes that'll allow the vehicle behind you to get stopped. So there are uh, defensive measures that you can put in place that will prevent you from being rear-ended uh, when you get your license, all right? So that's space management, speed management, posted speed limit, or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. And after you get your license, after you get your license, I strongly encourage you to drive the, tr the flow of traffic because that makes you more predictable. It's when you execute unpredictable actions on the roadway that you're going to get into trouble that you're going to conflict with other road users all right uh, so I'll just answer a couple questions then I'll come back to that point that I was making before uh, Carrie is it a good idea to scan ahead for places on the road where ice is likely to form when temperatures are around freezing black ice what is the best way to drive cautiously when encountering these places excellent point Carrie and that's one of the points that I didn't make uh, in the winter driving uh, presentation is is that where are you going to find ice on the roadways you, ice can it, it's predictable about where ice is going to form you are going to get ice usually in the morning after at night after the temperature has dropped several degrees as it does overnight and you're going to get it in one of five places low-lying areas high elevations anywhere when the roadway runs past a body of water uh, any place where the roadway lies in shadow 
and low-lying areas, okay? So those are the five places that you're going to potentially have ice on the roadways. Bridges and overpasses, that was the one that I miss, missed. Bridges and overpasses are going to freeze first because uh, it's cold, the cold air is on both sides. It's underneath the deck and it's above the deck as well. So that's where you're gonna get ice and snow as well. Uh, ice that you can't see. And usually it's gonna happen after you get precipitation, right? At night, it, the, the dew point drops, uh, water vapor in the air becomes liquid and then it freezes. That's how you get ice on, on the roadway. So that's where you're gonna find ice. So know that, and Corey's put the video up for, uh, that'll give you more detail on being able to locate ice, particularly in the mornings uh, when the sand trucks haven't been out, there hasn't been a lot of traffic and you're on back residential streets or byways and those types of things that haven't been cleared by maintenance crews. That's where you're gonna find ice on the roadways and potentially could get into trouble. And uh, as well, Corey, if you put up the video on five crashes in the winter time, I talk about the pickup truck phenomena and the one pickup truck in that video was actually on a bridge. So know that, that if you're driving on a, on a bridge, that's where ice is gonna form first. And as well, if you're driving a pickup truck, you've got that uh, unequal distribution of weight in the vehicle, you touch the brakes and the, and the pickup, the back of the pickup truck's just gonna come right around. So know that uh, on ice and snow. Okay, epic. Uh, and driving in the wintertime, bring the snow shovels, brush, and windshield de-icer liquid as part of your travel kit. Uh, yeah, snow removal laws. Epic is big on getting all the snow off your vehicles. Unfortunately, Epic, the reality is is that there are, and I, I mentioned this to you in a comment, and I'll just mention this to the other smart drivers. There are many vehicles that you simply cannot get up to the roof and get all the snow off up there, okay? You, need, you literally need a ladder, and a lot of people don't have ladders, okay? They don't have access to ladders, they can't reach up there, they don't have a brush that's long enough. So, there is gonna be snow on the roof of the vehicle, okay? That's just a fact of life, and it's, it's reality of driving, that there is gonna be snow on the top of vehicles as you're going down the highway. So again, this comes back to the point of defensive driving, the fundamentals of defensive driving are space management. Stay away from those vehicles because if you stay away from them and the snow is blowing off the top of the truck or the top of the SUV or whatnot, then it's not going to impede you and it's not going to endanger you if it comes off in a big chunk and hits your front of your car, right? Yes, there are laws in place, as Epic says. There are laws in place that you needed to get up there and do that, but that's not the reality of driving, okay? And there's always a discord between what the law says and what actually happens in the driving world, right? And we know <laughs> that traffic laws no more prevent crashes than criminal law prevents crime, okay? They ju it just doesn't happen. So we need to put in place strategies and skills and techniques that are gonna keep us safe for what really happens in the real world. And what happens in the real world is the fact that people don't clear off their vehicles. And actually, <laughs> I was shooting some video the other day and I saw this guy, literally he had like a little hunk carved out on the hood of his vehicle. He could just kind of see around it. I wish <clears throat> at the time that I wasn't on doing time-lapse photography because I would have liked to have put that up here on the Smart Drive channel, because, the Smart Drive test channel because it was pretty, <laughs> it gave me a good chuckle uh, when I was down doing that. So uh, I was talking about the four components, space management, speed management, observation and communication. And one of the points that I was making, <clears throat> unpredictable actions. And it can be anything on the roadway that is unpredictable actions. For example, I went down to one of the main intersections the other day and was shooting some B-roll for the videos and set my tripod and camera up on the traffic island in the middle of the road and cars are going by and I could see the, I could see the drivers because I was standing there for probably 10 or 15 minutes because I was shooting time-lapse photography and I could see the drivers in their cars as they're driving by going, what is that guy doing? Because when I set my tripod and my camera up, I look like a traffic cop with a, with a radar. So it's unpredictable. And that's what, what is happening with, and I'm distracting the drivers. So I know that. Okay, uh, Taka, am I allowed to turn left if there's double yellow solid lines? Yes, okay. Taka, excellent question, and I believe that some people may be confused by this, some smart drivers. Uh, solid lines in the middle of the road are not to prevent you from turning, they're to prevent you and to indicate when it is safe to pass. You can turn over double solid lines. Yes, you can, into a driveway or whatnot. <clears throat> a 
Lisa, you're most welcome. Thank you for tuning in and being part of the Smart Drive Test community and asking questions and, and making this really great. So again, all the Smart Drivers out there, uh, if you haven't subscribed already to the Smart Drive Test channel, consider subscribing as well. Hit that thumbs up, up button and if you're watching on the replay and have any questions at all, leave us a comment. More than happy to help you out. All right, Carrie, uh, at a traffic light, what is the best way to approach a red and or yellow light if the roads are not plowed and there is ice on the road? At times, one might need to drive on major roads in bad conditions. Yes, and as I said, Carrie, the best way to deal with that is to be looking down the road, de determining whether the traffic light is going to change to red, and then again, you know, getting your foot off the brake, allowing the vehicle to just roll, slow down back from the intersection and then creep up to the intersection, okay? So probably half a block back, maybe two thirds of a block, maybe even an entire block if you're not going that fast or determining. Because, you know, if the roads are bad, people are not gonna be driving that fast anyway, okay? If there's a lot of snow on the road and the roads haven't been plowed, uh, people are not gonna be driving the, the speed limit. They're not gonna be driving 30 miles an hour, 50 kilometers an hour inside the city. They're just not. They're probably gonna be driving uh, you know, 35 or 40 kilometers an hour and they're probably, you know, 15 or 20 miles an hour because the roads are bad. So know that, okay, that people are in fact gonna be driving slower uh, when the roads are bad uh, in snow and ice and in climate weather, okay? So uh, unpredictable actions and one of the ways that we communicate, we have to communicate well. So communication is another fundamental of both defensive driving and passing a road test. The ways that we communicate with other drivers uh, lights and signals, our horn, use your horn sparingly though in this day and age it's more of a sign of aggression than it is a sign of communication. Uh, hand gestures, make sure you use all five fingers, don't tell another driver or road user that they're number one, especially on a road test. Uh, eye contact, if you're not sure what another driver is doing, get eye contact and then you know maybe they can proceed before you and then each of you knows what the other is doing. And then finally, and the most important form of communication on the roadway, is the position of your vehicle on the roadway, okay? And if you, a vehicle is in the left-hand turning lane, there's a good chance, high, uh, there's a very high percentage that that vehicle is in fact gonna turn left, okay? So that's how you communicate with the traffic and execute predictable actions for the purposes of keeping yourself safe. And then finally, the last one is observation. You need to observe effectively to drive defensively and to pass a road test. So looking far down the road, uh, in, checking your center mirror far down the road, both shoulders, in, check your instrument panel. And again, on a road test, people ask me all the time about what, how fast can they travel, can they go over the speed limit or those types of things. You need to be checking your instrument panel as part of your scanning pattern every eight to 12 seconds. So if you're not adjusting your speed, the examiner knows, he or she knows, that you are not scanning properly because you're not adjusting your speed because you should be scanning and looking at the instrument panel every eight to 12 seconds while you're driving in a straight line down the roadway. So instrument panel, far down the road, check your left wing mirror, far down the road, check your right wing mirror, okay? So that's how you do that uh, for scanning patterns. When you're changing lanes or turning, mirror signal shoulder check, <clears throat> And I have people ask me all the time what the order of that is. It doesn't really matter what the order is, uh, but know that you're gonna be turning your signal on and shoulder checking almost at the same time. You're gonna get to the point where you can do that at the same time. And then, you know, checking the mirror. So you're probably gonna check the mirror, mirror signal, and then you're gonna shoulder check and put your signal on to make sure that there's nobody in your blind area, okay? Uh, and changing lanes, you need to do that. Three flashes on the signal, shoulder check again, and then start moving the vehicle over accelerate slightly because you're covering more distance, and then uh, keep your signal on until you're completely in the other lane. Turning left or right, approximately half a block before the turn, signal on, uh, up, mirror signal shoulder check before you get there, uh, mirror signal shoulder check again, and then go around the corner, okay? Reversing for the purposes of a road test or defensive driving. The reason that people get into backing crashes often is because they don't look before they put the vehicle in motion. I mean, and this has become, people are becoming more and more reliant on technology because they have backup cameras and beepers and those types of things in their vehicles. But still, I recommend that you look out the back window. And for somebody who's old school like me, who's driven all these older vehicles that don't have this tech in them, when I get in these vehicles that don't have any back window, I'm like, wow, that's kind of weird. 
<laughs> I still don't trust the tech, but I, it's coming, right? It's inevitable that we're going to have to be get used to it. Uh, and for the purposes of a road test, you can't use a backup camera. You can use, have a look at it, make sure you're in the right place, use it as an aid, but you still need to be looking out the back window for the purposes of passing your road test. Uh, and then before you start backing up 360 degree scan, look out the back window and that'll keep you safe while you're reversing. And as well, if you have any questions about that, have a look at the uh, reversing video and that'll help you out. Excellent. And Frank, my friend Frank is here. He's from the Michigan's Thumb, <laughs> where they're finally getting some snow. Uh, we got some snow last week as well, Frank. We have Actually, we've got a lot of snow here. <laughs> and uh, I spent quite a bit of time uh, shoveling. Uh, one day we had that really awful wet snow that you can't even push with a shovel. And uh, so I put a little video up and wish people <laughs> Happy New Year while I was out shoveling the snow from the driveway. All right, Epic took your driving test on the website and for driving tests, they have new hazard perception test feature. My question uh, for you, Rick, were you required to take a hazard perception test on your Australian car license? Oh, man, that was so long ago, Epic. I can't even remember whether there was a hazard perception thing or not. There probably was, uh, but there's lots of uh, good questions out there and whatnot. So really great stuff as well. Uh, Carrie, thankful to be learning from you. Love your passion for teaching others to drive well and be safe on the roadway. And you are most welcome, Carrie, and it's really great to have you as part of the Smart Driver community. Excellent. Uh, Nathan, hey Rick, I have my Class 7N for two years and I want to move to Ontario. Do I have to redo all the G1 and G2? No, Nathan, you can transfer your license uh, over to an Ontario license and they'll simply put you in whatever phase of the... Uh, the um, GLP GDL program that you're in they'll put you in the same phase so if you're in the learners phase they'll put you in the learners phase if you're in the novice phase they'll put you in the novice phase I'm pretty sure I'm almost positive that they will not make you start over if you've already done a lot of that work uh, and oh there was another point that I was gonna make it's gone the 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 the, the point <laughs> it's gone so my mom said it must have been a lie uh, so, right, this is the point that I wanted to make. I talked to somebody the other day who was still had their N and they're, they're like, oh, I still got my N and they were, I mean, they were like in their thirties. And I said to them, this is the point. This goes out to all smart drivers. Okay. I know that you can stay in the N phase indefinitely, but get your license, get your full license. Your insurance will go down. As long as you're in the end phase, you're going to pay an exorbitant uh, premium for your insurance. So as soon as you get your full license, your insurance will start to come down. You'll start to be eligible for all the bonuses of getting your uh, of, of insurance and helping it to come down. I mean, insurance is already crazy expensive. So get your full license and get your insurance to come down, okay? That's the reason that you need to get a full license. You need to get a full license so you can pay less in insurance because the sooner you get your full license, the sooner your insurance rates start coming down. Okay. <clears throat> and I might even make, I'll, I'll, I might even go and find somebody who's in insurance and talk to them about uh, driver's license and how to get the best rates for insurance. I'll see what if I can do that as well. Xavier, do you know of any good driving schools in the Metro Atlanta area? Uh, Xavier, send me an email and I'll have a look and I'll see what I can find for you. As well, Xavier, make sure you tell me where you are in Atlanta, which suburb, because I don't want to find you a driving school way over on the other side. But we can help you do that. Uh, Avery, I'm 14, get my permit in a couple of months. Do you have any tips for me? Yes, get your permit as soon as you can, Avery, so that you start the clock ticking because you're gonna be in a GDL program, a graduated driver's licensing program, and you're gonna have to have your learners for a set period of time so get your learners as soon as you can and get that clock ticking. Uh, so as soon as you're eligible, Joel, get your learners and get, get the clock ticking so that you can move on to the novice phase of your license. CT, uh, they tried to make me do my G1 at first. I recommend just do the second road test in BC. Okay, so there you go. So there's CT. Uh, maybe you two can uh, get together there and exchange information because it sounds like uh, CT has a bit more information than what I have. All right, so we're getting near the end. Make sure you head over if you are going for your road test, if you uh, head over to the Smart Drive Test website and pick up your road test checklist. It'll give you the 
things that you need to check off in terms of uh, getting ready and preparing and being ready for your road test so that you have the best chance of passing your road test. Uh, Xavier, rick at smartdrivetest.com. That will get you an email to me, okay? So do that. And so get that. Uh, Corey will put the link up for you for the Smart Drive Test road test checklist, and that'll help you out for being successful on your road test. And again, if you have any questions at all, uh, drop us a comment. We'll help you out. Uh, to be successful on passing your road test, air brakes, uh, CDL truck, or bus driver. We can help you with all of that as well. And uh, what else do I need to tell you? Yes, so if you like the information you see here, consider subscribing, hit that thumbs up button. If you're watching on the replay, leave us a comment as well. And uh, we'll definitely help you out and answer your comments and do the best we can to get you going in terms of passing your road test and being successful. Yes, so if you've had a road test in the last couple of weeks, if you had a road test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations on that. You passed the road test, let us know in the comments. It's always great to hear from smart drivers and hearing that they were successful in passing the road test. And if you have a road test coming up in the next week or two, uh, definitely uh, good luck on that. And be sure to check out the mobiles. I'm working on stories again, so I'm getting some of those up to help smart drivers as well uh, with tips and strategies in terms of passing your road test and being successful and staying safe on the roadways. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great day. Bye now.